Hey, everyone, and welcome to Chef AJ Live. I'm your host, Chef AJ, and this is where I introduce you to amazing people like you who are doing great things in the world that I think you should know about. Well, today is the first Monday of the month, which means it's time for McDougal Monday with Dr. John and Mary McDougal. I wore a very special t-shirt for him, which I put a link below if you'd like to get one, and of course, my potato earrings. Today, Dr. McDougal is going to be talking about colonoscopies, the gold standard that you may want to refuse. Please welcome Dr. John McDougall. Always a, a pleasure to see you, Dr. McDougall. Well, you like seeing me on, on the first Monday of the month, and I'm glad to be here. But, you know, this gives me an opportunity, AJ, to share materials with you that I think are really important and your audience. I mean, once we, once we appear on YouTube with the following that we have, I mean, so many people watch the presentations, tens of thousands. So you really give me an opportunity to, to perform. To, to try and educate people to do what I love to do, well, second best, which is to teach. You know, first best is to see patients, but second best is to, you know, to make information available to you. And that's what I try and do. And that's what everybody tries to do at the 12 day McDougal program is we're trying to open your eyes. We try and make it so that you can see. You don't have to believe us. I mean, we're certainly an affable group of people. But that's not why you should buy into our message. It's because we're able to bring the information to a level where it belongs to you. And you can make decisions. Just like the one you're going to make to avoid the multi-billion dollar a year colonoscopy business in the United States after this presentation. I, I, know, you, I know you are. Or at least you're going to think about it. You know, when the doctor uh, hounds you uh, at your home, or on your cell phone says it's time to get your colon exam. It appears in your computer and your email and your messages, get your colon exam. And by the way, we don't offer a sigmoid exam. We only offer a colonoscopy, which is part of the story that you're gonna hear over the next few minutes, is why don't they offer the best test available? Well, I think you're gonna figure it out. I think if you listened to me before many times, you figured it already. It's it's the money. I'm <laughs> sorry, it's the money. But anyway, you you can come to your own conclusions. And what I have is a slide presentation that you know I've never shown before, and I appreciate the opportunity to share this with you. Oh, I can't wait, Doctor McDougall. You are ready. All right, ready to go. Okay. Uh, for most of those of you who don't know me, I'm, I'm a medical doctor, uh, board certified internist. I have been a uh, assistant clinical professor and associate clinical professor at medical schools. Well, probably five of them. Uh, up until recently, I was licensed in five states. I think, well, it's hard to say how many states I'm licensed in now, but at least three. Hawaii, California, Oregon, Minnesota. And that, you know, pretty much extends all over the United States. I'm uh, pretty much allowed to practice medicine. And I've, I've been at it, I'll tell you. Not only have I been at the change in diets that have occurred over the last half century, but I've also seen the development of modern medicine. You know, I, it's been in my lifetime that they started doing heart surgeries, bypass surgeries, angioplasties. It's been in my lifetime that uh, we've been doing conservative breast cancer surgery and then radical surgery. It's been my lifetime that we've treated high blood pressure with pills. And we've had all these new diabetic medications that have been advertised to us. I've lived it, ladies and gentlemen. So, you know, not only being a medical doctor that's uh, personally cared for over 12,000 people, you know, I have lived at a time where medicine and nutrition ideas were developed that you're living with today. And it gives me the right to uh, have you question what you're being told to have done to yourself. I mean, after all, you're the ultimate in receiving benefits or harms, aren't you? I mean, you're the one that gets hurt. You know, not your doctor, not often. So you want to be an informed consumer and you can be an informed consumer. Uh, in this day and age, uh, you half the articles available, uh, scientific articles that I refer to, are open access. That means you can read the entire article yourself. And then about half of the articles, they are copyrighted and, you know, people try and make, publishers try and make some money off of them, even though many of these articles were paid for by your, your tax dollars and your consumer dollars. 
And there is a website. It's a changing website. It's, uh, it appears here on the screen. Let me get this up here a little bit better for you. It appears here on the screen. And I want you to write this down. You could get uh, pretty much any article that I'm able to get. You know, I have the university connection, so I get some scientific articles. But, you know, if I say something that seems a little bit off, uh, off base, or I can hardly believe that, or Dr. McDougall must be exaggerating. I, I'll go look at the scientific paper. Well, here it is, folks. You've got the address. It's uh, SCI-HUB. I think Science Hub is what it stands for. And then, and then a different country. And they've had to change the country that I've, I've referred to since I've been going to this website. Uh, it changed from Siber Siberia to, to Russia. It's now being held in Russia. So I guess you could say it's probably not as legal as it could be, but hey, you know, at least these folks, they believe you have, you should have access to the knowledge and, you know, hiding the truth from you just keeps you uh, being a, a victim. You know, you're not the kind of consumer you ought to be. Anyway, let's, let's talk about colon cancer and cancer is something I've been interested in ever since I started. You know, I started back in, well, back in 1968, I, I went to medical school. And uh, you know, I got most of my training in the 70s and early early 80s. I started being a, a doctor. And in that time, I've seen people go from low carb to high carb, and now they're back to keto diets. And as I say, I, I've been through pretty much all of it. And cancer has been one of my favorite subjects, and particularly breast cancer. But I'm going to talk to you about colon cancer in this particular presentation. Got interested uh, even when I was in medical school in cancer because in part, you know, oncologists are some of the most powerful doctors and most respected and most feared because the emperor has no clothes. That's why I discovered that later. But uh, even in my residency, I had this uh, special interest in why do people get cancer? It doesn't have anything to do with diet. And so I went to the first medical conference ever held on cancer. Uh, in part, I went it was in Seattle, Washington in the late 1970s. And part I went to meet this man here, Ernst Winder. He, he was at that time in uh, the late 70s, early 80s, in fact, all through the 70s and 80s, he was the most powerful person in the world in terms of science and disease, in particular cancer. He, he founded the American Health Foundation in 1969, which was a group of about 400 scientists top scientists in the world to study the relationship between disease and in particular diet. Uh, he founded the journal Preventive Medicine, which is still a very important journal today. He himself had published over 800 papers. And I, I wanted to meet Dr. Ernst Winder, who was uh, so well-respected and so much interested in diet and cancer. In fact, this is one of the first papers that you see on the right that, that I found which showed his observation, he wrote about his observation that women in Japan who get breast cancer live longer than women in the United States who get breast cancer. And the reason he proposed is because of what they eat. They eat a starch-based diet. And he published this in 1963. Anyway, I pursued this man and it was held in Seattle in 1978. A weekend. And I got in touch with Dr. Winder, Winder and I said, Ernst Winder, I, I said, uh, uh, can we get together? Can we have like breakfast together? And he said, sure. You know, we went to a breakfast table that was surrounded with a few other interested medical doctors and health professionals. And first thing that happened is the waitress came over and asked what we wanted to eat. And Ernst says, uh, I'll, have, I'll have whatever that, that young man over there is having. And of course, he got uh, oatmeal and blueberries. And then we started talking, and, and Dr. Winter started telling me he, did, he was not shy about talking about himself. And he started talking about how he discovered the causal association of smoking cigarettes to lung cancer. And here's this paper he published in 1950. He discovered this. He said, you know, I made these observations and, you know, none of these are based on a randomized control trial. It's all based on observations of what happens to smokers. And he said, I, I, I discovered this, that, you know, tobacco has carcinogens in it that cause lung cancer. 
And he, and he said, I went, I went to my, uh, my associates at Sloan Kettering Institute and the American Cancer Society and various other organizations. And I said, you know, smoking causes lung cancer. And he said to me at breakfast, he said, yeah. you know what their response was, John? They said, no, nah, it can't be. And I told him, he says, you just take it, you, you roll up this tube of tobacco and you stick it in your mouth and you suck on it and you get lung cancer. And they couldn't believe it. But that, that, that's who I was talking to, a person that famous who changed the world. And as breakfast continued, I asked him lots of questions. And then he got to the end of breakfast. He said to me, John, he says, you know, I'm the one who discovered that what you eat causes colon cancer. Oh, well, you tell me about that. He says, yeah, I went to my colleagues, Sloan Kettering Institute and other famous cancer doctors around the world. And I said, what you eat causes colon cancer. And their response was, nah, you gotta be kidding. He says, no, he says, you eat this stuff and, and, and it makes the, the colon sick, it, it, carcinogens, all kinds of things. And you get colon cancer. They, they couldn't believe it. But today, I don't think there are many reputable people who don't understand that what you eat is the primary cause of colon cancer, whether your intestines are, are sick or healthy. I mean, around the world, what you find is probably the most important association with colon cancer, and that's the consumption of red meats. Of course, we think of beef, but there are several red meats out there. And what you find is a direct correlation between death from colon cancer worldwide. You know, the consumption of red meat, that should be a good clue. But I, I don't want you to forget the fact that when people eat diets high in meat and dairy, but by obligation, the diet has to be low in starches, vegetables, and fruits. I mean, it's either one or the other. You're going to get your calories from fats and proteins and animals and oils, or you're going to get it from potatoes, rice, corn, et cetera, or somewhere in between. But there's a, a polarization of diets around the world where places like uh, in Asia and rural Africa, where they have very little colon cancer, they eat uh, a starch-based diet. They eat, I hate to, to be so specific, but they eat the kind of diet that I've been recommending to you for 50 years based on corn and rice and potatoes, et cetera. Very, very few animal products. Well, the science has, uh, has developed over the last, well, they started back in, Back in the 1960s, this kind of study worldwide. And science has developed and many, many issues have been taken to the laboratory. And a lot of the evidence uh, originally came from, from, from Africa, from rural Africa, where you've heard me talk about Dr. Dennis Burkett. He was uh, the head of ministries of health there. And he found no colon cancer in Uganda. When he practiced there in the 60s and 70s, he took care of, of like, 10 million people oversaw a thousand hospitals for 17 years and saw no colon cancer because they ate a starch-based diet, very few animal products. Yeah, so a lot of our evidence came from there and then we took it to the laboratory and we started studying things. Well, we're at the point where we can actually measure genetic changes that are produced in the cells as a consequence of eating red meats. Beef, for example. So that's how far the sophistication of science has gone. About uh, two and a half percent of people following the Western diet will have to face colon cancer. About half of them die of it. You know, half survive and they die of something else, heart disease, et cetera. Uh, your lifetime risk of getting colon cancer if you eat the Western diet. Remember, remember, rural Africa, no colon cancer, you know, in, in Asia up until they started switching their diet. No colon cancer. All right. So one in 30 chance in the general population of getting colon cancer. The uh, way that you uh, prevent colon cancer, and, and of course, I think a very important part in preventing colon cancer and treating colon cancer is a healthy diet. Even after you've developed polyps, I'm going to talk to you about how you can change the course of precancerous lesions, which is really the basis of prevention. I'm going to talk to you about other methods of prevention too, like sigmoidoscopies and colonoscopies, but you're going to understand the distinction as we go through it, because I'm going to go through it in a very orderly manner for you and, uh, and take some quite complex issues and 
you know, explain them. Well, you know, hopefully I explain them so that you can easily understand them. The truth is simple and easy to understand, and I'm going to try and make it that way for you over the next few minutes. So a diet is the foundation of the cause and the prevention and also the treatment of colon cancer. Now, this is out of uh, John Hopkins University. It talks about the natural history of, of the development of colon cancer. And what I want to do is I want to start up on, on the left-hand side of this chart. You see hyperproliferation. What happens is what you eat, and you know it's been focused on red meat and processed meat, but it's a whole darn diet. Uh, what you eat either provides a comfortable environment for the cells in your colon, or it is very irritating and damaging. The response to irritation of the colon, like other mucous membranes, is proliferation. The cells proliferate in greater numbers, and, and they, uh, they form lumps. You see it labeled hyperproliferation. These are, these are lumps that try and block the irritation. And through continued stimulation, and through continued irritation and damage, the uh, lumps grow bigger. And finally, they got big enough that we call them polyps. They get about oh, a little less than a half an inch in size. And, you know, we might call them polyps or maybe a quarter inch in size. We call them polyps. And that takes a while. I want to point out to you that to go from a no, normal colon to a mature polyp where it's ready to turn into colon cancer, and it's got to get about oh, a, little over, a little over an inch in size before there's even a significant risk of it developing colon cancer. It's been growing for 15 years in the precancerous phase. And then, and then it becomes cancerous. It, and to become cancerous, it, it, it invades through the colon wall into the bloodstream and spreads to other parts of the body, like the brain, liver, lungs, bones, and that's metastases and metastases kills. To go from the point where this polyp becomes cancerous to death from cancer takes another 15 years. So we're talking about 30 years of development. That's the spectrum. You know, so it's going to be important for you to remember that fact when we go on and talk about these instruments for early detection, for you to understand that to go from normal colon to a a barely cancerous polyp takes 15 years and another 15 years to kill you. Yeah. All right. Let's take a look at uh, what happens in that, in that polyp that becomes cancerous, all right? Uh, here you have one cell in that, in that polyp that develops, goes from a normal cell to a cancerous cell. And one of the qualities of a cancerous cell is that it divides at its own free will. In other words, the rest of the cells in your body, they, they live under rules. Like you can't go dividing unless, for example, you're growing as a child, then you can divide. Or if you cut yourself, then you can divide and repair the wound, but otherwise you're not allowed to divide. Well, this, these cells, they get irritated by the food that we eat in the colon. The cells in the colon get damaged to the point where they stop obeying the rules and they start dividing at their own free will and they divide at an orderly rate. That differs between different people and different diets, but the, the average doubling time is every 100 days. That's three and a half months. So that one cell that's cancerous and a polyp contains probably half a billion cells, but one cell becomes cancerous and it doubles into two in three and a half months, 100 days later, it doubles into four and then eight and then 16 and then 32. Uh, you've had cancer for a year. You've got like 10, 20 cells in this tumorous mass of a half a billion cells. The divisions continue. And uh, at uh, two years, you may have, by this kind of doubling every 100 days, you may have, uh, you know, some, somewhere around, uh, around 200 cells, 100 cells, 200 cells. You, but you've had cancer for two years. And at these points, what happens is these cells break through into the bloodstream, into the venous system. They go into the lymphatic system too, but the venous system is what's important. And that carries them to other parts of the body where they sometimes seed and become metastases. And the divisions continue. They continue. And finally, after six years of development, you've got a tumor in the polyp 
And in other parts of the body, you've got similar sized tumors. After six years that are the size of a tip of a pencil, a period on a paper, a millimeter in size. And finally, after, after 10 or 15 years, you've got a tumor mass that is a cancer that's really detectable. But it's been growing for 10 or 15 years. It contains a billion cells. So this is a very slow growing process. And so you've really got to catch it early if you're going to make a difference. And the problem is, is you can't really catch it early because of the fact that it spreads when it's like, I don't know, certainly fewer than a, than a millimeter or it's the size of a period on a paper picker. It's spread nearly 90% of the time. Try and, try and remember this natural history as we go through it because it'll make a lot, a lot more sense to you why early detection doesn't work. Early detection is really a late detection. You know, half, half to three quarters of the disease has already occurred without anybody knowing. All right, so the idea being, the idea being, the common sense being, the logic being that if you can find a cancer early enough, you can remove it before it has a chance to spread to the rest of the body. But as I just showed you, you know, it, it, takes, as, it takes as long as 10 years before the tumors are big enough to detect. So how in the world are you gonna find it early enough? Well, anyway, that's the hope. That, that's why you're told to, to screen, to do the, all these testings to find cancer early. And so the American Cancer Society, excuse me, U.S. Preventative Service Forces Force Task Force on, uh, on, on Prevention of Disease uh, has made recommendations. And they say that you should, as a mindful consumer, patient, citizen, you should be tested on a regular basis for early detection of colon cancer. That's the recommendation. And that recommendation was made in 2016, still stands today. Nothing's changed. Now, what the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force tells you to do is to check for early signs of cancer, and you could use any of seven different techniques. You could do colonoscopy, which is the most extensive. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about. You could do a flexible sigmoid, which I'll explain to you what that is. That's a shorter tube. You can do a, a virtual colonoscopy, which is an x-ray where they go in and they can find tumors that are about a centimeter in size, about the size of a eraser of a pencil, about the earliest size you can detect. Or you can do tests of stool for blood. You can do immunologic tests for blood. You could do tests for genetic material, which are called Cologuard. You got a whole bunch of things, but what I want you to notice is what they say across the top in red letters. These options are presented to you in, in no preferred order or rank. In other words, one is not better than the other. They tell you right up front. You go, how can that be? Well, let's, well, you know, I'll give you some basic information that hopefully we can refer back to, but I'll show you how it can be. Colonoscopy. The colonoscopy is uh, a procedure you're told to start having when you're, well, sometimes 40, sometimes 50. And uh, you need to go into either a, uh, a medical center or a hospital. And you get some kind of sedation commonly, uh, particularly in the United States, as opposed to Europe. And uh, you know this may even amount to an anesthesia. And then a tube, which is six to eight foot long, is passed uh, through the anus, up through the, let's, let's go through these parts of the, of the ball here. Well, I'll go through it again with you. Uh, here's the anus, you're up through the rectum. This is called the sigmoid right here. You see it kind of like an S, isn't it? Uh, this is uh, what we call the descending colon. This is the transverse colon. And this is the ascending colon. Well, the colonoscopy, the sigmoidoscopy goes up to about here. And we'll talk about that a little more later. But colonoscopy, they go through this whole, whole, uh, you know, eight foot long colon. And it takes about sometimes as much as three days of preparation of, of you taking laxatives, eating a no fiber diet, as, as much as three days to get yourself cleaned out. No, usually it's done if, if less time than that. And it takes at least 30 minutes to do the procedure. It's a big deal. Well, the US Preventative Services Task Force, they consider a colonoscopy the gold standard. 
and, and so do gastroenterologists. They'll tell you that, that it's the only thing that makes sense is to do a colonoscopy. In fact, there is a statement that I can show you that says that doing a sigmoid exam, which we're going to talk about, it's only a two-foot exam, versus a colonoscopy, which is like a six-foot exam, is similar to doing examining only one breast for, colon, for breast cancer. That's what, what they say. Of course, you know how I feel about mammographies and examining the breasts, et cetera. If you do, you know that uh, it makes a little, little difference and brings up a lot of harms. Anyway, they go on, the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force said, you know, we still think the standard, the gold standard is, is a colonoscopy, but, but we understand that there are risks involved, like bleeding and perforation. And plus, you find a lot of polyps that will never trouble the patient. This is called overdiagnosis. You'd have died of something else first, but because they found it, you have to live the rest of your life as a cancer victim. You can't get life insurance. You can't get health insurance. You can't get a job. This is overdiagnosis. This is finding tumors that would have never killed you. And you get overtreatment, which is really common. You know, it's, you have never followed a doctor from aggressively treating a patient. Well, at least that's what I found in my medical career. It's a $10 billion a year business, colonoscopy is. And, and this business is, is taken to the public. Here, here's some, uh, some highway signs uh, that encourage you. In fact, they shame you into not getting your colonoscopy done. I like the one in the bottom right-hand corner. There's a better way, get a colonoscopy. One way, do not enter. I think that was a coincidence. Anyway, you, you'd think you were stupid, you were foolish to not get a colonoscopy, wouldn't you? Well, let, let's, let's go on here a little bit. I wrote the first article on colonoscopy titled Colonoscopy, a Gold Standard to Refuse, the title of this lecture. I wrote this in August of 2010, so it's been you know, more than 12 years. And I told you in that article, I told you that colonoscopy doesn't work. Now, I told you at that time you should be getting a sigmoidoscopy, which I still recommend, and I'll tell you why. And then I went on and uh, talked to you in a further article in July of 2016. I encourage you to read both of these uh, evaluations. It discusses the, the current recommendations on whether you should or should not get a colonoscopy. Uh, the risk of colonoscopy, this is, this is not, not a benign procedure, all right? Uh, there are 3.4 serious events for every thousand people within 30 days. You know, there are estimates I can show you where polyps are removed that 7% uh, of people suffer serious complications. So like for example, bleeding. The most serious complication is perforation. This can occur in as many as one in a thousand people. And one in 2000 might be expected to die. Now you, you gotta consider we're making this recommendation to otherwise healthy people. I can think of two women in my practice that I heard about. I only knew them superficially, but the story is just as important. Two women, mothers, children, husband, job, you know, and fully having a great time, did their duty in their early 40s and went and had a colonoscopy. Both of them suffered perforation, but one of them died in the intensive care unit. colonoscopy can kill. And, and I want you to consider what you're agreeing to when you agree to have a colonoscopy. You're agreeing to risk your life today for the theoretical benefit that uh, finding a polyp early or colon cancer early is going to cause you to live longer 10, 20, 30 years from now. That, that's the bet you're taking. If you take in, you compare the life saved, the most optimistic uh, findings of life saved. Uh, one life is saved for every 1,250 people. But that's about the same rate as killing people with perforation. It could be as high as one in a thousand or one in 2,000, somewhere between one in a thousand, one in 2,000. So it's almost, almost, almost an even.
Okay, let's go on. So <clears throat> anyway, I, I, you, you need to consider this as a procedure done with harms. <clears throat> why, why is it done? Uh, why, why is it accepted the common procedure? When the US Preventive Services Task Force tells you that these are not ranked in any preferred order, your survival benefits are going to be the same. Well, this is the, this is the reason. It, it's cash is king. To, to check your stool well, if you do it with blood tests, it's somewhere between, you know, checking it for a couple of years, two or three years, it's somewhere between three and forty dollars to find out that you don't have colon cancer or high risk of colon cancer. You can have a, a Cologuard procedure, which is heavily advertised on TV these days. And these are, you know, highly sensitive procedures for detecting polyps and early colon cancer. But that costs, the last time I looked was about $600 to get that test done. Or you can have a sigmoid exam, which is somewhere between $100 and $200. Actually, I looked up in our town, they were like about $100 to $200 done. If you could find a place that would do that. No sedation, virtually no risk when it's done through a flexible sigmoid uh, instrument. Whereas if you get a colonoscopy done, it's $3,000. The latest study I want to talk to you about. This is what the one you want to look up. Okay, I, I I gave you the reference. It's easy to find. This is the the study that I want you to look up because it's such an important study and it hit all the news headlines. And this is the reason I'm bringing this discussion up to you is because you may have read the headlines, you may have gotten the false a false spin on the findings. Sometimes that happened. Not always. And you may be misled into thinking somehow this study showed benefits that should cause you to get a colonoscopy done. Well, not, not everybody was fooled. Here's some of the newspaper headlines or news headlines from Nature, for example, October of 2022. They showed huge trial yields disappointing results on colonoscopy. Here's a news report. Colonoscopy is not maybe as effective as thought. Study suggests doctors disagree. You see, the spin doctors get in there and they try and find some way to make you to believe that the findings are otherwise than they are, but they can't. Uh, editorial in the Lancet, controversy over colonoscopy for colon cancer screening. Doctors are talking about this, but the message they're getting to the patient is a little different. Uh, here's the study done. Well, okay. <clears throat> One thing I want to make clear for you is that colonoscopy and sigmoidoscopy and these tests for stool for blood and genetic tests, et cetera, they do find more polyps and more cancers. They, they, they do, there's no question about it, but that's not really important. Nor is it important how early they find it. What's important is that the end result is a benefit to you. And that means only one thing. And that means if you take and do a study called a randomized control trial, and you take one group of people and you don't do the test on them, and you compare it to another group of people where you do do the test on them, in the group that you intervened, in other words, did the colonoscopy or the sigmoidoscopy or the stool for blood, the group that you did the screening test on, you ought to have more people alive at the end of the study than in the control group. That's the only thing that counts because of what I told you. You know, I, I told you that, that testing and treating, it's not just the colonoscopy and the perforations and the bleeding, et cetera. It's the fact that then you have to go on to further tests that can be dangerous. You go on to treatments like surgery, radiation, chemotherapy. So if you're going to do a screening test that is of true value to the public, you must show that those who undergo the intervention, that group lives longer. A reduced overall mortality, okay? That's what you need to see. All right, so they did this study and yes, they found, they found because they looked. In, in the intervention group, because they looked, they found more polyps, more early cancers, no question about it. And they, they likely went to treatment earlier. No question about it. But the question is, is did they live longer? Did they live longer? 
they had less risk of dying of colon cancer, which you see colon cancer related deaths at 10 years. The invited group, 0.28% uh, of them had colon cancer related deaths, but 0.31% of them in uh, the usual care had colon cancer related deaths. In other words, you, you had fewer people dying of colon cancer and those who had the colonoscopy, all right? So in other words, you may have saved a life, but you ended up killing a person through the testing, the treatments, et cetera. So what we really need to do is we need to look at the bottom left-hand corner and we look, need to look at die from, die from any causes, overall mortality. And you see they're virtually the same. 11.03% in the invited group and 11.04% in the control group. They're the same. Here you can see the graph here, they're the same. This, this is the only, this is the first randomized control trial ever done on colonoscopy. And this is where the colonoscopy doctors had their hope that the business would thrive. Don't let them fool you. Yeah, yeah, you may be, you may be saving your life from colon cancer, but uh, you may be ending your life a lot sooner from death from anesthesia or colon perforation, et cetera. Okay, look it up. Look up the paper. First randomized trial ever done on colonoscopy. All right, uh, here's a review that was done in 2016 that looked at the previous studies and they said the same thing. They said, look, there is no randomized control trial. Other high quality evidence showing that colonoscopy reduces even colon rectal cancer mortality, even people dying of just colon cancer disease specific mortality we call it. You, 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 we saved you from dying from colon cancer, but you died of a perforation or anesthesia death or surgery death. That's overall mortality. Died from uh, disease specific mortalities you had, you had. They say there's not even a study, a good quality study that say you're gonna have a reduced risk of dying of colon cancer. You see doctors know that what I'm trying to share with you is the professionals know this but there's just so much money to be made. Well, it's not that way around the world. It's in the United States, and I'm sure several other countries, I haven't looked into it, but in Canada, the Canadian Task Force on Preventative Health Care, in 2016, they told Canadian citizens to stop getting a colonoscopy as a screening test. You, know, you have to differentiate screening, which I, I didn't do previously, and I could have and should have. Screening is when you go you go uh, looking for cancers in healthy people. It's, it's also known as disease monitoring. You turn uh, healthy people into patients. That, that's what screening is all about. You're looking at healthy people. If you have uh, a problem with your bowels, or say you flunk one of those fecal tests for blood, you'd be in a different category. You'd be in, into a category where we're talking about now a diagnostic colonoscopy. You're not looking for disease in healthy people. You've got somebody who's got a problem. You're going in to do the colonoscopy to look further into that problem, diagnostic. So the Canadian government, but that's the way basically all European countries have practiced is they tell their citizens to not get a colonoscopy. Well, this study, which was done in Norway and Poland that I just showed you, that was done on a uh, large population of people who've never been exposed to colonoscopy. So you should have found a lot of tumors. You saved a lot of lives. You should have. Yeah. <laughs> Let me take you back a few years and maybe I can put this in some relevance for you. As, as a medical student, um, part of my duty was to do a history and physical on a patient. And sometimes I do, you know, three a day. Sometimes I do 12. I remember one patient, he was 80. I had an enjoying life. You know, a, he was in for a hernia repair. And uh, my job was to do an exam on him. Of course, I was taught to do a thorough exam, which meant a rectal exam. And I did the rectal exam, you know, the finger exam, and I felt a tumor. I felt a cancer. And I was so proud of myself. I could hardly wait to get to his doctors and tell his doctors. 
and his surgeons that I found a colon cancer on this 85 year old gentleman who was enjoying life. Anyway, about three months later, I, I met up with uh, the surgeons who took him, my patient, my 85 year old patient who I found the colon cancer on, took him to the operating room. And I said, how's my patient doing? They said, well, he died on the operating room table. That, that's the first patient I saved from cancer. So uh, the way that you get misled in statistics is this, is look, if, if you die of colon cancer, in other words, a very withering disease, uh, your death certificate will say died as colon cancer. But say you go for a treatment, a chemotherapy, a radiation, a surgery, or you know, just further colonoscopies and they kill you in the process, then your death certificate is signed as that cause. Die from surgical complications. But the reason that he went for surgery is because he had colon cancer. It should have been, anyway, that's how the death certificates gets mixed up. And that's how some of the statistics gets mixed up. All right. What I should have done with this patient, just to add a little bit of information for you, and this may be stretching you a little bit, but I, I feel I have to. Because some of you will be faced with this. A, a decision that I was faced with uh, early in my career, and a decision that could have applied to my 85-year-old patient who I saved from colon cancer, who died on the operating room table. You understand the natural history of this disease. By the time it, it, it is at the point of killing you, it's been developing, it's been growing for 10, 15, 20, 25 years. You know, if it's spread, it's spread throughout the rest of the body. The course has already been determined. The cattle are already out of the barn. It's metastases that kill. All right, so some of you know, and the rest of you, I'd like you to know, it's the way I put through my, myself through medical school was I was a surgical nurse. Uh, what I did all day long, eight, 10, 12 hours a day, on the weekends, overnight, is I handed instruments and held retractors for doctors in the operating room. That's my job. I was in on thousands of operations. Then one of the most memorable operations uh, for me was one that involved two teams of doctors, two teams of surgeons. And it was, of course, a big setup for me as a surgical nurse with all these instruments for these two teams of doctors. One team started at the top, at the belly, and they made the incision through the abdominal wall, through the muscles. And the patient was strapped up uh, in, in uh, leg, leg braces so that they were exposing their perineum, their rectal area. And the other team, they got busy working from the bottom up. And about a half an hour later, this was the joke. The joke was one team would reach through the hole created and shake hands with the other team through the patient's body. That's called an abdominal perineal resection. That's still done today. Can you imagine the brutality, the risk of the patient dying from that kind of procedure? Well, you know, I had a chance to look at Dr. Madden's work, who is a uh, from New York, a, uh, extremely well-known gastroenterologist. And the way he approached this problem of having a cancer in the rectal area that would require, in most people's minds, these extensive operations, is he would take a wart burner you know, hyphrocated, you can actually pry these now. I don't know how strong they are, but the ones that we use were quite strong. It's just through electricity, it just burns stuff off like warts. And he would take this uh, uh, electrocoagulating instrument and he would just go over the tumor and destroy this tumor cells. Do you know what the results were? His patients who went through this minimally, non, relatively non-invasive procedure lived on average a year longer than those who went through the abdominal perineal resection. And still today, the doctors are arguing about what they ought to do. So if you or any of your relatives are ever faced with any kind of cancer treatment, but in this case, we're talking about colon cancers and rectal cancers and, you know, 
you want to get as little as possible done that'll take care of the obvious tumor with the least amount of mutilation and threat to your life. Too few of these procedures are done. All right, <clears throat> so yeah, these are your options and you can, you can start out by uh, checking your stool for blood. You can do an immunochemical test for blood. You can do a Cologuard test. You can do a sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy. You know, the US Preventive Services Task Force, they tell you it doesn't make any difference. And I showed you why. Because the, the overall survival is the same. Yeah, if you find, find blood in the stool, you have to go and have a colonoscopy. Then, then it's a diagnostic colonoscopy. I also explained to you how this develops. It goes from colon polyps that are caused by irritation of the colon tissues from the food we ate. And these are the precancerous lesions. And these are the lesions that we want to take out that may reduce the risk of dying of colon cancer. May, and I tell you why. I'm going to show you. Again, I'm going to show you a very positive side to the study before I'm done, to the research that, that, that has been done, done over the past years. And what a good percentage of the gastroenterologists understand, whether they practice this way or not, they understand what I'm going to be telling you about now. So you've got all these uh, different choices. Uh, which is better? Well, which is better? And the first place to start is in my August of 2010 newsletter, and, and read about it there, is uh, to do the sigmoidoscopy is a much preferred procedure. And the reason is, is because you you do it through this flexible tube, cost you know, a couple hundred bucks, maybe a hundred dollars, no anesthesia, uh, virtually no risk of a problem. But still you say to yourself, well, doc, if there are other tumors I should be catching, then I'm gonna miss the colonoscopy. I, I want the whole shebang, I want the whole procedure. But the findings are this, two thirds of the cancers are found within the first two feet of the colon. So a sigmoid reaches two thirds of the cancers. The other cancers that are further on have not been shown to, to provide a survival benefit when they're treated. Why? Well, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to get into that area of the bowel. You see that it's, you know, six feet away and you know, it's hard to clean out that area of the bowel. And there's this, a kind of tumor that occurs in the, in, in the ray colon area that uh, the colonoscopy reaches that it doesn't seem to be well treated. But what we find is the biggest bang for the buck is in, if we're going to save any lives, is in the left side reached by the sigmoid exam. All right, the positive side to this story is this. Is there was, uh, there's been recently been a review of studies done on sigmoid exams. One sigmoid exam between the ages of 55 and 64, there have been 180,000 people studied, divided them into two groups. One, one got the sigmoid exam, the other group didn't. One time, okay, between the ages of 55 and 64. Now, you would expect those who got the, uh, the sigmoid exam, you'd be finding more cancers, more polyps, more tumors, right? But what you want to do is you want to see, and, and maybe even less risk of dying of colon cancer. But, but since it's such a safe procedure, you shouldn't see the over, other side. It should be translated into overall mortality benefits. And what they say in this particular research, looking at these four major studies on colonoscopy, is that this is the first and only screening mortality to achieve this landmark. Okay, mammography, breast self-examination, PSA testing, lung cancer screening. I know there are people that argue about lung cancer screening. Colonoscopies. No improvement overall mortality until they did this one screening test. Now, they go on and say something really important, and that is the benefits were because of prevention. In other words, the benefits were seen by taking the polyps, which were not cancer out, the precancerous lesions. Once it became cancer, it was too late. They saw no improvement in survival with the sigmoidoscopy. But if you could get these little polyps out of there, then it would translate into a survival, overall survival benefit. And that's pretty encouraging, isn't it? Well, remember where the polyps come from. 
the polyps come from irritation. That's where we started this conversation like 45 minutes ago. It comes from the food, what you put in your intestinal tract. That's how you get the polyps. So wouldn't primary prevention be to eat a good diet? You know, they call primary prevention taking out the polyps that are precancerous. Well, that just shows you how uh, far along they are from the common denominator, doesn't it? All right. Well, what about if you change your diet? You know, somewhere around 40% of people eating a Western diet have polyps, at least 40% over the age of 40. So, you know, you pretty much, you, you don't know it, but you've got polyps if you've eaten the Western diet. So what do you do about it? Well, there's good evidence that if you stop what's going into the intestine and stop irritating the intestine, that these polyps will reverse. You see this in particular in a condition called polyposis, where they have thousands of polyps in the colon genetic defect. If you take and you divert the flow of uh, partially digested food away from the colon, you do this by putting a colonoscopy bag on the patient. And you don't allow any of the bad stuff to go into the large intestine, the polyps regress in about half the cases. So regardless of whether you have the sigmoid done or not, you've got to change your diet if you want the long-term benefits and even reversal of polyps, I believe occurs. So my recommendations are pretty much the same as what you'd get in Canada or hopefully Europe now, particularly since this large study done in Norway and Poland, other uh, Western European countries showed us just a complete failure. And you know why now, don't you? My recommendations are similar to what you're given if you happen to live in one of these countries, including Canada, is that uh, you can check your stool by these various tests, the blood test, the immunologic tests, mm -hmm. the Cologuard test. You can do that at recommended intervals, which may be once or could be as many as three times a year, once a year. And or you can get one sigmoid exam beginning about age 60. That's that's. That's a good time, ending about age 75. Why 75? Because if you got a colon cancer at that age, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, you're not going to live long enough to die of colon cancer. And, and below the age of 60, colon cancer is, is you know, comparatively rare. So this is the ideal time to be, be looking around for trouble. But remember, <clears throat> you know, you've got to face the consequences of finding out what's going on. And having one sigma exam at this particular age may be of value to you. Certainly a healthy diet can do nothing but good. All right, probably more than you wanted to know about colonoscopies, but I hope I at least stimulated the audience to realize that they're being conned. And uh, they, they should, you know, if you, if you have a friendly relationship with your gastroenterologist, and by the way, when I presented this August 2010 uh, presentation, I did it as an on-stage presentation, colonoscopy, a gold standard to refuse. So uh, there were three, three gastroenterologists in the audience. And if you read my September, my, my September 2010 newsletter, you'll find uh, I put in their responses to what I had to say. Now, I'm not afraid of the truth. You know, I know what's going on. This is a this is a, a cash machine, is what it is. And unfortunately, you're not benefited by it. And what would be even better? I mean, to be really, really acting like a, a healthcare professional. What people should be told is what how this conversation started, which is what you put in your intestinal tract determines its health or sickness. That's where the conversation should always start. And, you know, we should start talking about secondary preventions and treatments and so on way down the line. And all of these need to be evaluated by proper studies. And the proper studies show that uh, billions of dollars are being spent needlessly and thousands and thousands of people are being hurt unnecessarily. Some killed. All right, Chef AJ. Okay, so um, how would you like to spend the rest of your time? Do you want to only answer questions on this topic, or do you want well, to? You know, I would. I would appreciate having some questions on on colon disease to start out with. 
Right. Okay. After, after all, I spent the last week getting ready for you guys to tell you about colonoscopies. Right. So so I would appreciate some. I'd appreciate some feedback. Right. I saw a question from Tammy, but the thing is, she's not watching on YouTube, and I, and if you don't watch on YouTube, I can't see the Facebook comments unless I switch screens. So I wish the people would send their questions in in advance because apparently they had found something with her. And I, it, Tammy, if you can go on YouTube or send it in to us, because I can't really read Facebook comments, unfortunately. I do stream to Facebook and Twitter as a courtesy, but this is a YouTube show. So um, let's see if there's anything that came in just on the topic. That was, a, you know, I'm sure you're going to ruffle a few feathers with this, Dr. McDougall. I, I don't think so. Uh, I, I, I really don't think so. You know, my colleagues know what the truth is. And they're not going to brace the subject. You know, if we brought this to a national stage and somebody with my my simple level of understanding, much less a, a, somebody who's a professional in this or a research specialist, if they appeared on stage with some kind of opponent who told the truth, they wouldn't stand a chance. You know, you could see, you could tell the liars, you can watch them. You know, you can look in their eyes. You can see how they're shifting. They're called spin doctors. They're paid tons of money to lie, or they, on their own, make a ton of money to lie, or somehow enhances their ego. It's not for the patient's welfare. You, you know, a screening colonoscopy is harmful and basically useless. You know, the thing is, is you can't, at least I've never been able to find a gastroenterologist that will do a, a sigmoidoscopy anymore. They say they you know, don't. That's, but you know, why? You know, the, the four, there are four major studies, the ones that I showed you, you can look up, show that this is the, you know, the first time they've been able to show an improvement in overall mortality, a reduction in your risk of dying. Why isn't every office, office why don't they have one of these instruments? Why, why when I call Kaiser, do I have on the Kaiser Permanente website, a whole bunch of instructions on how to get prepared for a sigmoidoscopy and then when I talk to doctors I know that work for Kaiser and I ask him, can my patients get a sigmoidoscopy as opposed to colonoscopy? The answer is resoundingly no. Why? You know, if you can't see it, I don't know what to tell you because the evidence is overwhelming. You know, that, that uh, you put at risk, you're choosing a, a risk to die today versus the risk of being saved from colon cancer two or three decades from now. That's that's what you're asking is, is, is I'm, I'm willing to do that. I don't think so. I don't think if you, I know most of you, if you really knew what was going on, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do it. And you might even be so bold as to change your diet and put good food in your intestines. That would really be a knockout, wouldn't it? I'm, I know I'm talking to an audience that's all, all converted. Jeff AJ. So, you know, I'm just kidding, except for your, all your friends and relatives. I'm not kidding about. It's too much to think about eating oatmeal for breakfast and veggie burgers for lunch and bean burritos for dinner, which is what I had this weekend. That anyway, good. yeah, we can talk for a few minutes if you got some some questions. Yeah. I, can, so, I, can, so I can even invite I can even invite Marion if you'd like. Yeah, well, here here are some questions on the topic that you just discussed, and so the question is, uh, Mona says I had an adenoma in my last scope. Should I have a repeat? Nobody knows. Okay, the general recommendation is that you should have. It would be colonoscopy. You have one, one colonoscopy, you've done your time. Just like if you had one sigmoid, you've done your time. You shouldn't be doing it anymore if it's negative. If they found a polyp, then the general recommendation is about in 10 years. Some doctors recommend five, some recommend three. But you know, we've shown no survival benefit from any of these regimes. They ha it has not been studied. But what we need to do is a randomized control trial. I just showed you the first randomized control trial ever done on colonoscopy. It was just reported in October of 2022. It failed until they show a randomized control trial where they take people who've had a polyp or adenoma on one exam. 
And by the way, I told you 40% of people have polyps, at least on the Western diet. And they find a polyp. Uh, no study's been done that says if you come back in three years and have a repeat exam, you're going to live longer than if you don't. You'd have to do a randomized controlled trial. You'd have to screen some people at three years, or maybe you'd pick five, or maybe you'd pick 10. Right now, it's out to around 10 is the general recommendation is you should have it, but they don't know. I have no idea. My guess is it makes no difference at all. My, my guess is that you're not going to save any lives by doing these repeat colon exams, but I don't have the research, so I don't know. So Deanna, who's watching live, says her husband started a whole food plant-based diet in 2020 and put off a colonoscopy. By January of 2022, he was so anemic, he had to get one and now has stage four colon cancer. It would have been best for him to start a whole food plant-based diet years ago, but he wouldn't do it. Two years, yeah. ago, the diet did not reverse the years of damage. Well, you know, I, I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned here. One, she discovered two years ago, the blood in the stool and the colon cancer, but realized that it had been growing for probably 20, 25, 30 years before she got to that stage. It spent 15 years as polyps, precancerous, and another 15 to get to the stage where he's got stage four. Stage four means it's all over the body. Remember, these tumors, these solid tumors, they start to spread after say a year of doubling, by a year of doubling, you only have 12 cells, 12, like one, two, 12, 12 cells in a tumor mass that contains a, a half a billion cells. You can't find it. But at those stages, at, at those early stages of one year, two years, certainly before six years, what has happened is these tumors, these cancer cells, that are in the colon cancer or the polyp, you know, that's kind of the descending, the, the distinction between polyp and cancer is it really is a cancer. These, these cells, they spread through the veins to the brain, liver, lungs, and that's what kills. Your, your husband is not gonna die of colon cancer. Your, diet, your husband is gonna die of cells that have spread to his brain, his bones, his liver, his lungs, and replace normal tissues. It's not going to be pretty either, and it's not going to be inexpensive. It's I, I feel sorry for you. Does it do any good for him to change his diet now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in, in my uh, February 2015 newsletter, okay, let me say that again, February of 2015 newsletter, the American Cancer Society presented a position where they told doctors all over the United States, Here's a message to you docs, is you need to change the diet of your patients who have cancer to the kind of diet, they didn't say Dr. McDougall, but they meant it to the kind of diet that Dr. McDougall recommends, even after they have cancer. And there are studies that show that people who, who have colon cancer, if they eat a healthier diet, they live longer. It's just like I showed you that Earth's Winter article where I discovered herbs, but he'd written about it in 1969 when he saw that Japanese women who got breast cancer lived four times longer than American counterparts. And he, he, he kind of knew back then it was due to the fact that the Japanese women lived on a starch-based, low-fat, very few animal foods diet. You see, it, when, when you get a cancer, what you have, you're in a situation where the, the, the cells are doubling. And if you do things that encourage the cells to double, you know, like throw gasoline on a fire, they're going to double faster and more aggressively. Your immune system depends upon it being healthy, and it's going to go and try and fight those cancer cells. But if you eat an unhealthy diet, you're going to impair your immune system. So it's kind of a double-edged sword. You encourage the process to overwhelm you. By the time you get to, I told you, you know, I, I told you that it's uh, it's about one centimeter is about the size. That's the size of an eraser of a pencil that you can find the tumor at about 10 centimeters of cancer, about 10 times as much is when the patient dies, when they have a tumor load that high. It just keeps doubling and doubling and doubling. But the average doubling times every 100 days, but some people, they double their cancers every 
you know, 200 days, but some people double their cancers every 24 days. You, you want to be a person who doubles your cancer cells every 400 days. You want to be a person who dies of colon cancer when you're 180. You know, you, you just want to delay, delay death and disability as long as you can. And, and you can do this by changing your diet even after you have something as devastating as colon cancer, lung cancer. It's never too late to change. And that's what the American Cancer Society says in their position paper, which they put out February 13th of 2015. And I wrote about it in my February 2015 newsletter. Stop throwing gasoline on the fire. So hopefully your husband is in living. You know, people would say, well, you know, are you going to cure me? Well, that's really not the important thing, patient. The important thing is to give you as much good life as possible because we're all going to die. And, you know, when, when threatened with uh, an untimely early death, you know, people, of course, don't entirely see that picture. But as a doctor, I do. You know, as a doctor, I've watched people get old and die. And, you know, I understand what the course of... of health and diseases. And I know that if you live in good health, you're better, you have a better chance of, of, of living long and well, just like John Scharfenberg, one of your best guests has had, you know, but that, that he just improved his odds. That's all he did by understanding the message of Ellen White, who wrote the diet on the Council on Diet and Foods back in the early 1800s and told Yeah, you know, 150 years ago, she told that. Ellen White did. And John Scharfenberg is only 100 years old. So, you know, his parents and grandparents listened to Ellen White. Anyway, uh, there, there are a lot of Adventists that have lived past 100 years of age. You look at uh, Dan Butner's work. Areas of the world where there's a, uh, an ordinary large number of uh, octogenarians, no, centigenarians, people who have lived over 100. Uh, an unusual number, uh, uh, a positively happy number of people living to be more than 100 years old. And there are places uh, like Nicoya, Costa Rica, and, and in uh, Italy, and Greece, and Loma Linda, California. And, there are a few places around the world that people have lived to be over 100 years old as, as you know, more than the usual population. And they have in common the fact that they eat a starch-based diet. Dan Buechner kind of tells you that in his new book. Have you seen his new book, Jeff? Yes, I had him on the show. It's beautiful. His father's in it. His father is. Huh? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. His father, Roger, there's a picture of him in one of his favorite recipes. Well, you know, Dan's made a, a wonderful contribution. This book is well worth getting. Uh, you know, it talks about how people, it talks the same story that you, know, you and I have been sharing with this population for a long time. For me, it's been 47 years I've been sharing it. For you, it's been maybe a dozen. A dozen. Well, a little bit longer because I've been 45, but you just, you just didn't know me for that, that time. But I was always, uh, you know, singing it from the rooftops. Well, any, anyways, it's it's an old message, and it's it's the truth. And, and the sooner you learn it, the better you put the odds on your side. Yeah, and, uh, there are ways to learn it. I mean, listening to Chef AJ's show every every you know, every day, every day, five yeah. times a day this week, <laughs> Doctor well, Mutu. Well, one of the viewers says, "Is it possible to reverse benign polyps completely simply through a whole food plant based diet?" I think so. I believe so. No studies ever been done. There's one study done where they kind of attempted it where they took people with polyps and they kind of put them on a high fiber, low fat diet, but it was, you know, inadequate. So it really hasn't been tested. It's just like, you know, the diets where they use, you know, they teach a, a low fat diet versus a low carb diet. And they report that uh, Ornish's diet doesn't work, et cetera. Well, you know, they they never follow the diet. Uh, so anyway, there were one, there's one study done which did not show reversal. But I think the, the best evidence is what I just showed you. I gave you the research paper. You can look it up on, on uh, the website I gave you, SubSci. And uh, what you find is that when they divert the flow of fecal material away from the colon, which is what you do with a 
kind of diet I teach, a starch-based diet, you send all the bad guys away. Then what they saw is they saw reversal of polyps. I believe it was over half the cases. Um, yeah, this, you know, you're at a stage where you're you're still just causing cell proliferation. Look at it this way. There are certain tissues in the body that are mucous membranes. Uh, they have smooth, we call them smooth muscle cells. And uh, they're in the nose and, uh, you know, the, the rest of the sinus area. Uh, through the entire intestinal tract, you have mucous membrane cells. In the, uh, the cervix of the uterus, you have uh, mucous membrane cells. And when you irritate these cells, what happens is they, they become hyperplastic. In other words, uh, they proliferate into lumps. And then they eventually grow into big lumps, which we call polyps. And if you keep stimulating these areas in the nose and the cervix, et cetera, in the bowel, uh, long enough and serious enough, you know, poisonous enough, then um, a few of them turn into cancer. Uh, but at these early stages, uh, well, like I said, it'd be good to do the studies. But uh, I believe you're going to at least slow or stop the progression of polyp development. And that means, you know, if you have polyps and die with polyps, it ain't no big deal because polyps don't kill. Cancer kills. So if you can stop the, the progression of the cancer, the cancer's changes in the polyps, that's all you really want to do. Whether you see them actually disappear. Even though mine, did. mine did by just changing my diet. I mean, I was vegan for 26 years with a terrible diet. When I was diagnosed with edematous pre-colon cancer, I just changed my diet to your diet and they were gone within six months. Cause I, and I, I, you know, I had, I did have colonoscopies cause I would have this information that I don't. It was, diagnostic. It, was di it was not screening. It was diagnostic. Yeah. But they're no fun and I don't like them and I don't want another. And I actually did have a very good friend die of, 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 of a rupture. And he was just going for a routine when he had no problems. You know, he had turned 60 and he had one and then he was dead like within a week. And that just makes me really squeamish for having that again. Well, if they were telling you the truth, that'd be one thing, Chef AJ. But they're not. They're lying to you. Uh, if there was, a, you know, a, if, it was, if you would go to Las Vegas... And you put a bet on a table that, that says that you have 10 times the chance of, of living and avoiding dying of colon cancer if you have this procedure. You'd probably do it. But, you know, if the odds are against you or even, you might not bet your life on it. Yeah. yeah. I had bleeding, though, so it was different. I wasn't just getting it. And I was in my 40s, too. And I had a really strong family history of colon cancer. And that's one of the questions in the chat, Dr. McDougall. People are asking if they've had parents that died of colon cancer, right. should they get one? Nobody knows. You know, I would say no based on the research. It's not going to do. You shouldn't act any differently than the general population. And that is, and there's no research to show otherwise. There's no research that says people who have an increased, uh, have a family history of colon cancer, if they undergo uh, colonoscopy, that they'll live longer. It doesn't exist. Don't believe it to be true. Uh, the way you need to think about it is this. Your parents can tra trans transfer disease risks to you through their genes. You could inherit bad genes. Doesn't happen very often. Or you can inherit your health through education. I, I learned to smoke cigarettes from my parents. They both of them smoked. And that's what I learned. I learned to not exercise from my parents. I learned to eat, uh, you know, Bologna, bring bologna sandwiches and eggs in the morning for breakfast from my parents. That kind of inheritance you can change by, by stopping the destructive eating practices that they taught us. So yeah, you can. I'm, you know, some of you know my history. You have a really interesting history of colon adenomas, but you know, I, I had a history of, of near death in my 30s. You know, I almost died when I was 18 and it continued that pattern until I figured it out. Now I'm almost 76. So, and, and loving it, by the way, sort of, <laughs> it's okay. There are a lot of good things about being 76. Dr. McDougall, you want to hear a negative comment? A couple yeah. of them? Okay. So Irene says, 
This advice can kill you. I know Dr. McDougal believes this, but he is wrong. You're free to do what you want, but read the research and statistics yourself, not rely on one doctor says, whatever his reasons, eating this way does not 100% guarantee that 100% of people will not get colon cancer or polyps. The chance of a perforation are extremely low. I had a polyp removed at 71 during my first colonoscopy, which was done for a completely different GI reason. And I have been a vegetarian since 1974 and whole food plant-based, no SOS since June of 2012 with no family history of colon cancer or polyps. Dr. McDougal is barking up the wrong tree and this is not his subspecialty or area of expertise. Well, you know, all I can say is I'm a general doctor, and I can read, I can understand, and I can prevent, present the science to you. That's why I put the references down in the right-hand corner of the slides. You can read them. You know, go look, go look it up. I'm not exaggerating. And as far as colon cancer not being 100% preventable, there's been no randomized control trial on that, but there's a lot of evidence that says it is. And some of that evidence uh, I learned when I was a senior in medical school from Dr. Dennis Burkett. And you'll, you'll uh, listen to an hour lecture uh, from Dr. Burkett in my January 2013 newsletter. Uh, this is a, a man who uh, became a surgeon in Edinburgh, Scotland. And uh, after his surgical training, he and Clive and Thrall and Walker went to Uganda, Africa. And these four, you know, who became very famous doctors, each and every one of them, they went to take care of the people in Uganda who lived on a starch-based diet. You know, still primarily do. They live on a diet based on grains and root vegetables and vegetables and so on. Dr. Dennis Burkett, he served as the head of ministries of health for 17 years. He took care of 10 million people he oversaw a thousand hospitals. He reported that he saw not a single case of colon cancer or colon polyps in his entire experience in Uganda over these 17 years. You know, I mean, read the research on the incidence of, I showed you in one of the slides, I showed you the incidence of colon cancer country by country based upon their animal food intake. It's there, read it. So anyway, you can come on and say, Dr. McDougall is wrong, but you haven't read the evidence. You know, there's a bunch of plant-based GI doctors now, like Dr. Will Bolshevitz, and they all recommend colonoscopies. Yeah, well, what I, would, what I would enjoy having them do is to explain the, the study I just talked to you about. Yeah. Well, Lisa no. said, what about having just one to see if you have polyps? You could, you should. Didn't I tell you to have one sigmoid exam at age 60 to 75? She's seen colonoscopy though, just to have- Oh, well, but because you're, you're, you're risking having a serious problem if there's polyps found, which is, you know, 40, 50% of the cases, you're at risk of having a serious complication of bleeding, perforation, anesthesia, et cetera, in 7% of cases. That's what Kaiser study showed. But I gave you I gave you some other research papers that showed similar risks from having this procedure done. I know, I know, never hurt your gastroenterologist to undergo this procedure with you, did it? They do perfectly fine. Probably never heard of one of them. Right. But it's look. Someone saying they have bowel leakage, should they get a colonoscopy? Depends on the cause. While walking. She's been whole food plant-based five years. Well, did she stop all the oil in her diet? You know, uh, or, or, Orlistat is what, do you remember that? Uh, they used to put Orlistat on uh, potato chips. They used to, it's kind of fat. Do I have that right? Yeah, it was, and they said it called anal leakage. Oh boy, yeah. crazy. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's, it, it's undigested fats that, cause terrible diarrhea and leakage in people. I think that was the name of the oral stat, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, well, I'll look it up, Oliestra or something. Olestra, maybe? Yeah, Olestra, thank okay. you. Okay, so Tammy reposted her comment. See, because guys, my chat goes so fast that it does disappear. 
She said, I never did colonoscopies. And at 57, I did Cologuard. And then my first ever colonoscopy, December 19th, 2022, I had an 8.2 centimeter tumor, 14-29 lymph nodes. And in three areas of my tissue near the tumor, plus I had two small polyps that were benign, but the kind that become cancerous. I've eaten whole food plant-based for almost six years, not vegan. They got it all, but are suggesting chemo for microscopic particles that may still be inside of me. What is your thought on that? And what is the percentage that people get metastasis? That's a lot of questions. Yeah. Uh, look, you, it, from what I heard you say, you have, you have an eight centimeter tumor. You know, that's like, uh, you know, three inches in diameter. That's a big guy. And you have positive lymph nodes. You've got cancer that's already spread throughout the rest of your body. This is stage four cancer. You know, the idea that, uh, that taking uh, chemotherapy is going to catch this little micrometastasis that are spread through. You already died. Your doctor told you you've already had cancer spread throughout the body. What you need to do is you need to go right to the research. You need to go to the National Library of Medicine and you need to find the randomized controlled trials of using these drugs to chase down micrometastasis. And you need to see results that show an improvement in overall mortality. That's what you need to see. But you won't find those benefits. If you, in my last review of chemotherapy for colon cancer, extremely disappointing, the results. So, you know, and then, then but you know, but excuse me, customers. Excuse me. The, the, the obligation to prove something that's being recommended to you by your doctor lies with the recommender. In other words, if somebody's telling you how to have something done that is going to risk your life, cause you serious side effects, cost you a ton of money, then that doctor, that healthcare provider should be the one that prevents, presents the evidence that this is going to do you more good than harm. It shouldn't be somebody like me or you having to go to the research to find out what the truth is. Don't you think that's fair? I do. It, it just happens, you know, and I realize I don't have as many degrees as many people do, but I'm a board certified internist. I've seen 12,000 patients. I've taken care of 6,000 in a resort situation. I've written 13 national best selling books. You know, I got some credibility. And um, anyways, I may not re me reach out to your uh, level of, uh, of excellence, but I do want to tell you, you want to discuss the data, I'll be glad to do it any old time. In, in the meantime, I can just tell you what I believe to be the truth. I'm not hiding anything. So, you know, you want to read it? I showed you how to find the papers. Free. I showed you that. Do it. Please don't put me in a situation where I have to have some anonymous doctor or patient tell me that I'm full of baloney. But I'm not. I'm not even vegan baloney. Dr. McDowell, Diane says, can a CAT scan show polyps? Yes. But they have to be a centimeter in size, the size of an eraser of a pencil. That's how big they have to be before. And it, they have to reach a uh, about 17 millimeters, which is 1.7 centimeters, which is about, I don't know, you know, it's over half an inch before they have a, uh, let's show you a, a very small percentage chance of being cancer. I, I gave you the data in the, the slide. Mm -hmm. uh, when, yeah. when, they're, when they're less than a half of a centimeter, they're virtually never cancerous. They get to be uh, almost two centimeters, then there's a small percentage that are cancerous already. The longer you irritate them, the more powerful you irritate these cells, the faster they're going to turn into a cancer situation where to be a cancer, not only do you have to have funny looking cells under the microscope, these cells have to have the ability and the desire to spread to other parts of the body. That's part of the definition of a cancer is they metastasize. And um, by the time you find a tumor in the breast or the colon, the prostate, 
the lung, it's on average of these solid tumors, they're 10 years old. They've been growing for 10 years. They've already spread. That's why early detection doesn't work. Now, if you can do something preventive, which of course, primary prevention is diet. Secondary prevention is removing precancerous polyps, which a sigmoid does effectively, and has been shown in four major studies to improve overall survival, which is the first screening test to ever show that. I showed you the statements. You know, I showed you the research, read it. You know, I, I, I would say that, uh, that I would say it just an overall, uh, the way that you ought to feel as a consumer, as a patient, as somebody desiring healthcare is you're being cheated. You're not being told the problem, and the problem is the food. You're being told the uh, profitable solutions to a problem. Lots of tests, lots of treatments, lots of hospital visits, lots of doctor visits, lots of colonoscopies. These are, are, are dollar generators. Cash is king. What about telling you to eat potatoes? Excuse me? How do I make money doing that? <laughs> Well, you write 13 national best-selling books, folks, and you spend 50 years promoting them. That's how you do it. Dr. McDougall, there's a lot of chat about the Kolegard test because some people are saying there's a significant possibility of a positive finding of blood that is not related to cancer. What would you recommend as the next step? Because uh, apparently sometimes Kolegard might be wrong or inconclusive or vague. Well, well as, as far as I understand the Kolegard test, and I'm you know, I could be a, a better expert on that, but as far as I understand it, what they're looking for is uh, genetic material, DNA. They're not looking for blood. They're looking for genetic material that's produced by a polyp or cancer. There's a, a change in the, the secretions that are in the stool that show genetic changes. So that's what a Kolegard test does, uh, whereas a, a, a stool for blood, or an immunologic test for blood, the FIT test, uh, they actually test for hemoglobin for blood. So um, they're different tests. What you do next is, is see, that's a screening test to do a Kolegard or a stool for blood, et cetera. Those are screening tests. Once you find blood or a positive Kolegard test, then the next colonoscopy you have is a diagnostic test. When they do a diagnostic test and then they implement treatment, the overall survival is no better, regardless of which test you use, except possibly the same one. That's the only one I could support. Uh, are, are people are asking if there's any risks to sigmoidoscopy. Virtually none. As a student, you know, I, I did pretty much everything I did to my patients. It was short of open heart surgery. I didn't go that far. But uh, I was at Drosky Ferguson Drosky, which is a Grand Rapids colon rectal specialty hospital. It was part of my training as a junior and senior medical student. And uh, I volunteered. But at that time, what they did is they we had a tube that was about that long, about an inch, about a foot and a half, called the silver sword. It didn't bend. And I laid down on that table and I had a full sigmoidoscopy exam. Something I'll never repeat. It was not done under any, any sedation at all. And I remember this being quite distressing, quite painful. People are asking what you feel about coffee enemas and colon cleanses. All right, let me finish my silver sword story. Sorry, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I, I, have, I have performed as a general practitioner over, let's just guess, over 300 of these exams myself on patients. It was my job, you know, but it was part of my routine physical examinations. I was a GP for seven years. So probably 300 of them. I wouldn't be, maybe I'm off by 100. Doesn't matter. This is not a pleasant thing. But these days they have, because of fiber optics, they have, there's no longer the silver sword. It's a flexible tube that easily bends, virtually never perforates. And the important thing is that tumors that you can make a difference in, well, in this case, polyps, two-thirds of them are found within the reach of the sigmoid. 
And the ones that aren't in the region of the sigmoid, somehow they don't seem to fit into the type of tumors or the findings that transfer into a survival benefit. But I think I know why. The only way you can show a survival benefit is by taking out polyps. Why doesn't a colonoscopy show that? Because the colonoscopy has the other side, the perforation, the bleeding, the anesthesia, et cetera. And then the likelihood of probably more follow-up visits, more surgeries, more anesthesias, et cetera. You know, it's a more thorough exam. They find more things. They do more things to you. But, but it doesn't matter, ladies and gentlemen. It doesn't matter. What matters is when you accept whether you're not going to have a mammography, PSA tests, you know, C-135 for the uterus and ovaries and whatever these different screening tests are. All you care about is, is this test going to cause me to live longer and secondarily better? And the research shows no. And I just showed you the latest and greatest study ever done, the first randomized trial. Doesn't work. Very disappointing. Doesn't work. You, you, can, you can accept that or you can live in, a, in a, a world of fantasy. It's up to you. However, if there wasn't an option, you know, AJ, I've said this many times you know, when I talk about heart surgery. You know, heart surgery doesn't save lives, period. You want to argue about that for an hour? I'd be glad to. Or, or, or breast cancer surgery, mastectomy, et cetera. You want to argue about that for an hour? I'd be happy to. And by the way, you can get prepared because I've done those lectures on YouTube, thanks to Chef AJ. And they're all up there. So you can see all of my ammunition. You can see all my research. You can become well-educated before you present it. Any controversy with me, I'd be glad to. But anyway, you know, I, I, I feel that people, and, and I've been criticized a lot through my half a century of, of practice. A, a, lot, a lot of people will say to me, look, Dr. McDougall, you know, why don't you just be a food doctor? Why don't you just be a nutritionist? Well, why do you have to come in and criticize what I'm doing, which is to make a ton of money off of heart surgery and breast cancer surgery and diabetes treatment. Why, why do you have to get involved in that, huh? Huh? Well, the answer is this, is if, if the standard medical profession is, they got all the money, are, are holding out a, a, a way out of your problems for you that works, you're going to be more inclined to do that than to change your diet. But if you realize what they have to offer you is a lot of pain and expense, and, and no survival benefit, and they don't, then you might look for an alternative, something as basic as eating potatoes, sweet potatoes, corn. You know, you might get so desperate that you'll come to the last corner in town. You might even go so desperate that you come to one of our 12-day internet programs where, you know, we almost guarantee you're going to change your life. No, you could do it on your own. The, the basic McDougal program is on my website for free, drmcdougal.com. I don't know. Uh, and and uh, if you, if you, those of you, and I don't want to sound uh, defensive, but I know I'm starting to. <laughs> if those of you who think that I'm presenting the information incorrectly really think so, you know my email address. I'd be glad to discuss this with you privately. Or I'm sure Chef AJ would be glad to talk to you uh, in public with me present. Done this many times before. Won't be the first time that I've had an adversary to be on stage with. Well, Dr. McDougall, somebody named Mary saying, you know, Dr. Jean Ornish's wife, Anne, got breast cancer, so she believes in screening. Okay. But, but you weren't, we, people can have them. We're not, you know, we, we're not. People are allowed to do what they want. Well, there's, there's no question screening finds problems. Mammography, you're going to find more tumors while you're still alive. But the question is, does finding these tumors translate into a survival benefit? Yeah, you spent the money, the time, the, the risk of testing, et cetera. You spent all this in your, in your time you've been alive, trying to find these early tumors. But does that translate into you living longer? The answer is no. 
the only proof that a screening approach works is you take a large group of people at risk, you divide them into a control group, you don't do the screening procedure on them, and you divide them into another group called the intervention group, and those you apply your technology to or your drug or whatever. You set a period of time, five years, 10 years, et cetera. And the intervention to be proved worthwhile must cause the intervention group to live longer. It doesn't. They may have less risk of dying of colon cancer, but you killed a whole bunch of them on the operating room table. Kind of evens out, doesn't it? Anyway, the, the people that do the, uh, when you read the sigmoidoscopic papers that I cited for you, you'll see that they understand that by the time you have an early cancer, which is like, you know, 10 years into development, it's too late. And they take credit for any survival benefit being removing precancerous lesions. Well, okay, I'll give them credit for that. Through a sigmoid. Not through a colonoscopy, through a sigmoid. That's what the tests show. Anyway, look, they they have all the money, all right. You know, this is a this is a ten billion dollars a year, just in the U.S. Make ten billion dollars a year just doing colonoscopies. Do you, do you think what I'm sharing with you today is has a chance of making a difference? I do. That's why I'm doing it. You know, I, I believe that some people will take what I have to say seriously about a good diet and about the failure of standard medicine when it comes to treating chronic disease, the utter failure. You know, I, I think maybe I'll wake somebody up who's willing to look at it, a patient, a healthcare provider, a hospital administrator, Somebody will look it up and say, you know, this is probably important. But, you know, I don't know. Sometimes I, I showed you in the first slide that you know, I've been at this a long time, 50 years. And I, I've gone from a phase where people tried to lose weight uh, with the Atkins diet, the low carb keto type diets, and that I went through a phase where I was popular and so was Ornish. And then we went back in the 2000s to a phase where we were kind of equal. And over the last 10 years or so in the 210s and now 220s, the keto diets are, are winning out, sort of. But, but because of so much information, you know, somewhere around 86% of people in the world have access to the internet. The liars, the cheaters, the polluters cannot no can no longer hide because of these devices. You know, if you if you wonder whether or not, like in this presentation, which I plan on being controversial, all my presentations are controversial. You can look it up to see who's telling you the truth. Or, or we can get into, uh, you know, uh, what they call them, pissing contests. So you can put a couple of adversaries up here, and you can see who who is who, who gives the the um, the most pleasant presentation. I'm getting better at being pleasant as I get older. So, Doctor McDougall, what do you think about coffee enemas and? colon cleansing people are asking? Well, you know, a couple of things, and I'm glad you asked me this question, because I didn't know Max Gerson, who presented 47 cases of cancer cure to Congress in 1947. Max Gerson used a diet kind of in the direction that uh, we use. Charlotte Gerson, I knew Charlotte, <clears throat> but uh, her dad, Max, is uh, the one that's so famous. And he used a, uh, a near vegetarian diet and he gave coffee enemas to clean out uh, the toxins in the body so that the, the body could work more efficiently. He also gave thyroid hormone. I, I don't think anybody's ever been harmed by a coffee enema, whether it helps or not. Max Gerson believes so. 
so uh, thyroid hormone, I don't, I don't know. Certainly, I think the Max Gerson therapy, which has been put to, well, yeah, his was, you know, maybe his was. Uh, I may be confusing it with, uh, with Livingston's therapy. Uh, Virginia Livingston, she was at the same time, worked in the same genera, the same, same era as Max Gerson did. But they actually put her survival benefits to test compared to and compared to standard therapy. And the conclusion of the article, which was published in a big journal, was that uh, Virginia Livingston's people didn't live any longer than standard therapy. And they took this as a criticism to her approach. My thought was, it just shows you that standard therapy doesn't work. Anyway, um, okay, the coffee enemas, yeah. What do I think about people having enemas? Uh, it could be a learning experience. Could be a learning experience, and again, I've I've, I've earned the right to talk to you about uh, high colonics. Uh, I certainly had plenty of associates that did high colonics, where they take a a, a tube and they they put it up really high in your colon. High colonics—that's what I call high colonics—and they squirt a bunch of water in, and then, then they have another tube that takes the effluent out. And they, uh, the ones that I saw, the instruments I saw, had a, a glass tube so you could see the stuff coming out. You know, the water goes in, the coal, and the stuff comes out. Okay, so uh, first I want to start out with the idea that uh, a bowel movement feels good. A big bowel movement, consequence of an enema, I would only guess feels real good. So, so there's some appeal there being cleaned out. And of course, you lose some weight. That may be an added advantage. And then what the colonoscopist would do to the patients that I was sharing with them is they'd say, look at that, look at that glass tube. You see that stuff coming out of your colon? That's the sludge that's been built up over decades from you eating the Western diet. You see that? Well, what it is is undigested food. As I told you, I told you many times, I told you in this lecture, you know, I've spent my my years as a student, as an operating room nurse, I've been in thousands of abdomens. I, I've, I've cut through hundreds of colons. I've never seen a sludge coat in a colon. Neither has any other surgeon. Anyway, so that's that's kind of what it is. Is a, a bowel milk feels good. A, I can only imagine a high colonic feels really good, and they scare you. But the good part of them scaring you is most of them teach you a healthier diet. And they tell you you shouldn't be eating all the meat and dairy, et cetera. They should be eating more plant foods. So that's the positive thing about going to see a colonoscopy. But the idea that you're cleaning out decades of sludge is complete nonsense. You know how you clean out your colon? You put good things in through the top. Chew them up. That's how you do it. Swallow cleans out real good. Some of you may need a laxative, a little prune juice to get things going though. Anyway, uh, I'll skip the jokes. Mary Singh, are you saying that more people die from colonoscopies than from colon cancer? Equal. Equal. In, in other words, what you do is you save one life for every, and this, this is optimistic, for every 1,250 colonoscopy is done. And you kill about one life for every thousand people or 2000 people, somewhere in that range. So if you save a life, say, say you did, say you saved a life. I, I question whether you ever do, but just say, let's give them a life. In a thousand colonoscopies, you kill the one person in a thousand colonoscopies. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Does that sound clear, AJ? I mean but they don't tell you this. They just say that, that it's very rare. That This is what I always hear. It's very rare for somebody to die. Well, it is rare. It's one in a thousand. You know, it's 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 7% to have serious complications that may require them. I told you, it's, uh, well, anyway, I gave you a whole bunch of data on that slide. But this is not a benign procedure. This is a risky procedure. How risky is it? Well, if there's no benefit, it's too risky. You know, if there's some benefit, then you have to weigh the good versus the harm. The research says it does as much harm as good, if not more. And, you, and, and the 
and the healthcare dollar that's being spent is like like 10 billion a year plus you take people's minds off of what they should be focused on well hey i don't have to worry about colon cancer it doesn't matter what i eat the doctors will save me do a colonoscopy they'll save me never happened to me anyways well it does but I tell you, two and a half percent of the population eating the Western diet develops colon cancer. So, you know, it's not, you probably only have a couple of friends that have died of colon cancer. Yeah, maybe, you know, three or four or 10, something like that. So Dr. McDougall, Nora is saying, if somebody is going to have one, do you recommend any specific type of prep or what's the best prep or the best diet? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, what you do is you, 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 before you go in to see the initial doctor on, on your initial evaluation, you just sit in the parking lot for 15 minutes and you practice saying no. No, 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 I'm not going to have this done. No, thank you. No, that's the prep that I think you ought to make. Until, until doctor, you show me the evidence that this procedure will do me more good than harm. Dr. McDougall says no. Here's the here's the uh, the YouTube presentation Dr. McDougall gave. Tell me why he's wrong. Otherwise, I'm not going to spend three thousand dollars. I'm going to take a vacation instead of spending three thousand dollars on a test that could kill me. You know, I'm not going to take a test where I'm risking my life this afternoon for the possibility that you're going to save my life a decade or two or three from now. I'm not going to do it, Doc, unless you can show me the benefits. Yeah. Anyway, they, let's let's see if I can get back to this. Somebody's saying they'd like to see a. No, oh, I guess you're not sharing. Well, I'm going to share anymore. Oh, oh no, no, I of course I am. Unless, yeah. unless it. Oh yes, I am, Doctor McDougall. Yes. Are you seeing the? Are you seeing anything? I'm just seeing. I know that you're sharing, but it's just a black square right now. Oh, you know that may be okay. I just did it wrong. I just hear. Them. <laughs> you want to hear another negative comment, Doctor? Yeah. I know you always said you'd rather be hated than ignored. Linda says. This turns my stomach. Is Dr. Bolshewitz wrong? Is Dr. Christy Funk wrong? Are these lifestyle <laughs> experts in their field misleading the statistics? Well, you know, here's the study. Come on, folks. Here, there it is. And Susan's saying colonos colonoscopies are free for people with good insurance. Okay. But you still have to pay for your insurance. Because you know something, there's something to that free colonoscopy that we ought to talk about. And, and that is that... Uh, the colonoscopy may be free, or the mammography could be free, or the bone mineral density test may be free. But there's a downside that's not free. And that is if you take the test, you become a patient. And then you become a customer for the pills or the surgeries or the hospitalizations or whatever. So yeah, you can afford to give the test away for free. No problem. No problem because they make money on the downside. After you find a customer, then you can ding them for drugs and procedures, et cetera. But the first thing you got to do is find them. So yeah, I'd give colonoscopies away for free. All right, let's see if we can get this up here. I'm just going to try one time in the hopes that While you're looking, do you want me to ask a question? Or? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, James says, I had a colonoscopy at 52 and 62 with no polyps. Should I ever get one again? I'm sorry, I have to listen to that question. Do you see the slide now? I do see the slide. The latest okay. research, largest study, NEJM, October 2022. Yeah. Okay, and let's see, we have... Okay, here's here's what the media reported. You know, just so you know, you could get you could start with the non-spin. Okay, uh, Nature told you a huge trial yields disappointing results on colonoscopy. That's from Nature. That's pretty respected, huh? How about uh, what is this? 
uh, uh, colonoscopy may not be effective as thought study suggests. This is the Nord ICC study involving Poland, Norway, Sweden, and, and the Netherlands. 85,000 people. Or even in the Lancet, they say there's controversy over colonoscopy screening. You know, they, they, regardless of what, what your gastroenterologists, you know, just care to spin this data, you can't spin it, folks. You, you, you plain and simple, you got to look at the research. Okay, the first, first randomized trial on colonoscopy, write it down, you know, so that you have a chance to read it. I'm going to be on the first first Monday next month. You tell me why you should get a colonoscopy after reading this study. The thing is, is they don't read it. They just, they listen to who they want to listen to. And I'm not saying they shouldn't, but most people aren't reading the studies you're providing. Well, that's why, that's why I make available an opportunity for them to get the papers, no charge at all, free. Almost every paper ever published is present on that uh, sub science website that I gave you at the beginning of the lecture. Go read, make an expert of yourself. But you better come, if you're, you and I are gonna talk about it, you better become thoroughly, thoroughly versed in the subject because you believe me, I'm gonna prepare. Don is asking for your email address. Are we allowed to give it? Sure. Okay, it's pretty easy. It's just your name at yourname.com, Dr. McDougall at drmcdougall.com. And I, I almost always answer my emails unless it's stupid. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> there are a few out there, but, but anyway, do you, do you see the research? Okay. You know, you can read it for yourself. They, they reduced the number of people who died of colon cancer by 0.03% colon cancer. But the overall reduction in mortality was 0.01%. In other words, there wasn't a significant benefit from screening after 10 years of looking at 85,000 people. Read the paper. There's the chart. Risk of death, I just showed you. Here's the randomization. You see the blue line matches the red line? You see that? Do you see the usual care group invited those who got who didn't get colonoscopy versus those who got the colonoscopy? You see, there's no difference. I'll tell you, this made some people really mad in the colonoscopy business. That's why there's so much controversy about it. But you know, it's only people who have a vested interest that are spinning this in the wrong direction. I believe. I accuse them of that. They have vested, vested interests that spin this in the wrong direction. They may believe that they're saving a patient's life from dying of colon cancer, but it's their belief. Do you want to do things based on somebody's hunch? Or, or do you want to look at the research? You know, I really wasn't prepared to uh, find that even sigmoid reduced overall mortality. I wasn't prepared for that. But, but I provided this for you, this information. Uh, about uh, sigmoid exams. That's good one. Okay. Uh, here it is, right here. One sigmoid exam prevents cancer death. But you have to realize look at the third paragraph down. The second paragraph tells you this is the first and only screen modality to achieve this landmark. In other words, mammography hasn't, PSAs haven't. Colonoscopies haven't, you know, it says right there. And, and then it goes on and says death reduction in the third paragraph. I put it in gray for you. Death reduction is accomplished by prevention of colon rectal cancer by polyp detection and removal, thereby arresting the proposed polyp dysplasia cancer sequence, not by early diagnosis of colon cancer. By the time it becomes colon cancer, the, the preventive possibilities are done. It's already spread. Anyway, they take credit and they call this, they kind of indicate this is primary prevention. But what I'd like to point out to you, 
But this is secondary prevention. Primary prevention is to eat good food. So you don't get the polyps in the first place. And then there's no such thing as, as pre prevention once you develop cancer. Once you develop colon cancer, or breast cancer, or prostate cancer, and it's real cancer, it's spread. It's throughout the rest of the body. However, the positive side of this, there are two positive things I want you to get out of this. One is you don't want to end up harmed by the medical profession because of incorrect information. And the second thing you need to know is that your body is always healing. Even if you have breast or colon cancer, we can show evidence of healing that occurs in people who actually have the disease. We can see the immune system killing the cells. The body never stops healing. If you give your body a chance, where you make your immune system work to its fullest, and that involves a starch-based diet, and you stop the things that are fueling the cancer, which is the meat, the oil, the, the vegetable oils, the, the lack of fiber, et cetera. When you, when you stop fueling the cancer, you put the, the trend in the favor that you wanted, and that is you're gonna live longer. That's what the February, February 13th, 2015 Declaration for the American Cancer Society says, is even if you have cancer, you need to change your diet. So anyway, um, you, know, you shouldn't, you should, you should know what the truth is, all right? Uh, you're gonna save yourself by fixing the problem. The problem is the food. Everything else is off the table because it's gonna do you harm and good if you're lucky. But it's going to do you more good than harm if you're lucky. All these treatments do some good and some harm. And uh, you know, if, if you if you fix the food, you fix the cause of most of our major problems. You know, and this is nothing new that I discovered. I was a I was in my last year of internal medicine residency at John Burns School of Medicine, and on my day of departure, after I had my degree. Believe me, I, through medical school and my residency, I was always on the verge of being asked to leave because I, I you know, it's my personality to challenge people. Well, you say this, well, show me the evidence. And, you know, a lot of my mentors didn't like to be challenged. But anyway, I, I was called into my chief of medicine's office the last day and my chief of medicine told me, he says, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm worried that you're going to starve to death, you know, teaching this crazy stuff about food. All you're going to collect is a bunch of bums and hippies. I said to Irv Schatz, Irv Schatz was his name, he's died. Head of internal medicine, John Byrne School of Medicine. I said, but 80% of the problems I have are caused by food. You know, plus, you know, I understand that what I was taught as an internal medicine specialist by and large, causes a lot of harm, and most often more harm than good. I know this. So I said, you know, even if I starve to death, because all I'm going to do is collect a bunch of bums and hippies, that's the way it's going to be, because I can't do the things that you're asking me to do to my patients when the research says that it's wrong. I can't. I, I told them that in 1970, 1978. But he was wrong and I was right. It wasn't bums and hippies that I collected. Uh, I have to say universally, my the people that I've been able to talk to, people in your, your audience at Chef AJ, are by and large successful people. They're not bums and hippies. They're people who have gotten a, a good education, built great businesses, put efforts into their family, their social life. They're successful people. And these successful people, they ask themselves along the way. They ask they ask themselves or people around them. I'm such a big success. You know, I, I put myself through this advanced degree education. And I, I, I'm the head of a multi-million dollar year business. And I, I have a family that I'm real proud of. I'm such a big success. How come I'm such a failure in my health? And I told my chief of medicine, I said, when they, when they asked that question, I said, I'm going to be there. I'm going to tell them it's the food. And I've been telling you it's the food since 1978 or nine. Long time.
I haven't changed my mind. It's the food. Anyway, you, you got this slide up here. You got the picture. You, you know how to look at the studies on colonoscopy. And I'm real pleased. I'm real pleased that I have some positive news for you. I'm also pleased to tell you that if you do get a cancer, you ought to talk to your doctor about doing the least possible to accomplish the goals. They're not going to save your life. What they're going to do is control local disease because it's already cancer. It's already spread. So how do you control local disease with the least amount of harm? In the case of Madden's work, you know, remember the doctor from New York, the surgeon I told you about. And by the way, still we do uh, these type of local hyperfications, these local treatments like with a wart burner. We still do them on elderly people, people who are high risk of surgery. So this is not a procedure that's been buried. It's just been relegated to those at high risk. But it should be done on those at low risk. Why? Because aggressive therapies kill. Remember the story I told you. One group of surgeons starting at the top, cutting through the belly. The other group of surgeons at the bottom, cutting through the anus. And they meet. And before they have lunch, they shake hands. Big joke, right? Probably not if you're the patient or the family member. But anyway, the risk of dying is increased by a year from this aggressive therapy, as opposed to burning it off with a wart burner. But this applies to pretty much all the cancer therapies. You know that I recommend lumpectomies. You know that I recommend no treatment for prostate cancer, at least initially, until it becomes symptomatic. You know, I, less is better. You, know, you don't realize that. I know you're getting a whole bunch of information that convinces you the more you do, the better the results. But it's not true. Read the research. Well, I think anyway, that's enough of those slides. Now you can look it up and you can come on Chef AJ's show next time to she's on and, and to tell, tell why Dr. McDougal didn't tell you the truth. <laughs> they're, they're saying, what about like when it diagnoses other things like ulcers or things that are diagnosed, maybe not just cancer or polyps? Uh, okay. Well, you know, it depends what, what you're looking for. You know, the gastroscopes. We used to do upper GI, what we call barium enemas. Uh, let me see if I can get us back to the meeting here. <clears throat> All right. Anyway, we'll, we'll just talk like it is. Uh, we used to do uh, barium enemas, where we, there was the upper GIs, they were called, where you swallow this opaque material. And then when the fibroscope came in, it became a whole new, a whole new surgical business. Because here are doctors, gastro, gastroenterologists, who are making you know just money by talking to people. You couldn't make a lot of money. You didn't have any gimmick. But once the gastroscope and the colonoscopes were invented, then the gastrointestinal specialists, they, they were considered almost like surgeons. And so they had this gimmick, these tubes that they could go in and poke people for and charge them, you know, invade them and charge them a whole bunch of money for. It. Now, the question is, is did all of this improved technology result in a better outcome for the patient? I just showed you with colonoscopy, it didn't. How about gastroenterology? How about ulcers? How about upper GI? How about stomach problems? Did it result in a better outcome? I'd have to research that to tell you. Um, but my initial thought is probably not. Probably not. I, I don't think we've done much to improve the welfare of our patients with all the technology. We know more, no question about it. But we've done, made so little progress in terms of what really makes a difference. Well, the statistics are, you know, you've probably heard these, that this is going to be the first generation that is outlived by their parents, this new generation. They're sicker. The, the modern therapies that have been offered to them aren't prolonging their life. Uh, my generation is going to live longer than my kids. They're going to and the grandkids even worse. Because the bad died, because the therapies don't save lives when it comes to chronic disease. When it comes to acute problems, yes. You know, like, like sudden heart attacks, you can probably make a difference with the procedures, but not chronic coronary artery disease. 
you know, certainly if you get in an auto accident, you want to have the surgeons involved to fix the bones and the skin, et cetera. But th that's that's a, an acute automobile ex a, accident that tears you apart. You need a little help being put back together. So there are some wonderful things in medicine, but it hasn't lived up to its reputation and all the advertising when it comes to diabetes and heart disease and cancer and obesity. Good grief, look at the obesity problem. You've seen it right in, right in your lifetime, not just mine. Anyway, you have another question? Uh, not not on this topic. I'm not seeing any more. Well, you know what? Well, let's just take a couple more. Then I should probably quit. Yeah, no, you got to go have lunch. Um, gosh, but, 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 but let me just say something, you know, so I don't get to be accused of taking a defensive attitude about this, is I really do appreciate your challenge. But I expect you to step forward and tell me why. At least write me an email. Now, I don't want to hear about somebody's opinion, okay? I have lots of opinions out there. Really, it's because they found cancer or because they had somebody in their family with cancer. That's what they're saying. I know. But, but those who have some type of professional training, you know, and you have some right to question what I'm doing and you have the knowledge to question what I'm doing, you know, give me the opportunity. I can't think of a better teaching method than to have different points of view presented at the same time in a civil manner. And of course, Chef AJ will arrange that for you anytime you want. Yeah, if, if, you at least, if you at least start by explaining to me why you, you want to take a stand against the evidence. Why do you want to believe different than what the research says? Tell me why. Huh? All right. Well, anyway, Chef AJ, maybe what we ought to do is tell people that um, I, we're going to be doing another 12-day um, internet-based, telemedicine-based McDougal program starting in just a few weeks. You go to our website, drmcdougal.com, to, to get enrolled in this. This is a, a way to change your life. We've got the best staff in the world. They're going to help you make dramatic changes in the way you look and how you feel and the medications you take and get you out of unnecessary procedures. And I've been even known to defend my patients against care that they were being given or recommended by calling up their doctors and talking to them. I've been known to do that. But of course, the, the patient has to be willing for me to have that kind of intervention too. But anyway, uh, that's what happens when you become a McDougal patient. The only way you become a McDougal patient is you enroll in one of our programs. We don't take any, you can't call up and get an appointment. You can call up and get an appointment with uh, with Dr. Lim to see whether or not you'd be a good candidate for our pay, for our program. We'll do that for you. But unless you become a McDougal patient, uh, and, you know, to, to accomplish that or to have my personal interest, at my age and stage, I, I can demand to have results in my patients. I don't have to take one night stands which is regular, what a regular office visit offers. You know, our goal is to get people to be well, to change their lives. Anyways, we've got this coming up. Um, we also, every Sunday night, thanks uh, to a great deal with the help of uh, Chef AJ, we do a question and answer hour on Sunday evening at 5 p.m. Pacific time on our YouTube channel. So you get, uh, go to the McDougal, McDougal channel and uh, you'll be able to ask questions there. And we get to a good, good share of the questions on, on mon Monday night or on Sunday night, Monday Sunday night. at 5 p.m. Pacific time. So that's, that's some of the things we're, we're involved in. You want to learn more. Uh, but, you know, in the books that I presented and in the uh, YouTube presentations that I presented, I think I made my point pretty clear. I thought it was great, Dr. McDougall. And again, everybody can decide for themselves. No, they can't, Jeff AJ. They can't? They can't <laughs> well, because, well, they mean... because they're, they can decide for themselves that they have access to accurate information. Otherwise, if you're being told things that aren't correct, you can't decide for yourself. You know, it's you don't have the education. You didn't go to medical school for seven, eight, 10, 12 years through medical training. You don't have the resource 
it, it, you 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 have to you expect your doctors are going to provide a higher moral level of care than the general population. You expect more from your doctor than you do from a used car salesman, but it's unrealistic to expect so. You're dealing with people who have vested interests. So yeah, you could decide for yourself if you have the information. But if you're being lied to, or you don't have all the information to make the correct decision, then I hope I provide this service. So you can make the correct decision. If you're, there, you're going to be a sheep, you know, you're going to follow, what well, they say, you follow like a, sh a sheep, or get some animal rights people upset with me using that analogy, but you can't do that. Your, your spouse, yourself, your children, your parents are too important. You know, if, if, if everything that I did as a doctor resulted in good outcomes, then I could tell you, I, I, I could just say, hey, you got to do this. But since there are bad outcomes for these procedures, I need to get you involved in the decision, but I have to provide you with accurate information. I think, what do you think, Jeff, Jeff AJ? Well, people like Claire are asking, do other doctors agree with you in the plant-based world? Or are you the, are you an are you no, the I'm sure they do. I'm sure I, I have no doubt that the other doctors in the plant-based world agree with me on colonoscopy if they read the research. No doubt. I don't think you'll find a physician who will do anything except come on the show and spin the data. That you know, I, I can't think of anybody, I can't imagine anybody coming to any other conclusion after they read the study that I showed you. It would come to any other conclusion, but the results are disappointing to say the least. Thank you, Dr. McDougall. Less than advertised. Any idea what you might but, want to But let's see what happens. Let's see what happens. Maybe, maybe, and believe me, I would be happy. Like I say, if, as long as it's presented in a civil manner, there's some, some people out there that don't know how, don't know how to, to have a discussion without getting personal. Uh, I'd be glad to talk to them about it. Or, I, but even better, I would be glad to have them write me, Dr. McDougall, drmcdougall.com. I'm sorry, what else are we going to do? Well, you know, every time or uh, for the last couple of months, I've told you that I was going to do a presentation on uh, uh, glucagon-like uh, peptide, one agonist. In, in other words, I was going to give, give you a little talk on uh, uh, poisoning by the Gila monster from the Northwest. <laughs> by uh, Osempic and Wigami and the other GLP-1 agonists. They're so popular. I was going to do that, but I haven't gotten quite ready for it. I, I want to make sure that I've got all, all the information properly in order before I present that because, you know, rather than having a discussion with an industry that's very unlikely to do anything contrary to what I had to say. The drug industries, you better get it right. Or uh, if anybody listens to your information or a significant number of people, they're gonna react. So, you know, I've been a little bit hesitant about bringing this uh, presentation to light until I get it just the way I want it. You know, it's and interesting. I'm, I'm close, I'm close. Dr. McDougall, it's interesting because when people don't agree, they can often get nasty. And I, I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Peter Rogers, who just adores you so much. He has a regular slot on the show and he does a very well-researched two and a half hour presentation once a month. And his last one was on soy and he is not a fan of it. And he provided so much research about why he personally would need it. And people just attacked him like crazy. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, you ought to listen to at least listen to what Dr. Rogers has to say, uh, and see what the other side of the story is. Decide, decide what you. Yeah, but they get upset, but they still won't read the research. They at least read it and then get upset, you know. But, you know, one of the things I'm most proud of uh, Chef AJ is a lot of my colleagues and many doctors I, I've never even met. They'll say to me, they'll say, "Well, when I finally do meet him or communicate with him, they'll say." Well, you know, I want you to know, Dr. McDougall, when something new comes out, the first thing I do is I see what you had to say about it. And then I go and I read the rest of the stuff because, you know, I do present a very clear 
factual based discussion of these things, just like I did with you in colonoscopy. If you don't like what I had to say, that's fine. There are lots of people who say different. But if you want to hear what uh, I wrote a book published in 1984, which has been a worldwide national bestseller, which we give free quite often from our website. You can go up there and check and see whether Heather has any books up for free this week. It's called McDougall's Medicine, A Challenging Second Opinion. So what's that, 1984? That's 40 years from ago I wrote that book. And you know, Chef AJ, I don't think I'd have to change a word in it. Yeah. Somebody's saying they are between, they're 55, they don't want a sigmoid test. Do they have to do it? Well, you know, just as, just as preferred is a test for occult blood. It costs you $3 or $40. So that, that is a preferred test. If you pass that one, you're just as good as if you'd had a colonoscopy or sigmoidoscopy. Remember, the, the Canadian government and most countries in Europe, and I recommend that you have one test for colon cancer between the ages of, well, they say 55, I say 60, and uh, age 75. One test, you either have a sigmoid exam and or you have a stool test. That's, that's all you need to do. If you're negative on either or both of those, either one of those, then you're done. You don't need to get any more testing. So uh, just do a stool for blood. Do you have to do any of this? Your risk of getting colon cancer is like two and a half percent of the population eats the Western diet. That's not very high. So, you know, especially if you lived a pretty good life, uh, eating a diet similar to, to what I recommend, your risk of getting colon cancer can be as few as the people in Uganda, Africa. Dennis Berger found no cases of colon cancer in Uganda, Africa, with these people following a starch-based diet. 10 million people, 1,000 hospitals, 17 years of study. That's, that's the way the world used to be. It used to have a very low rate of colon cancer because the world used to eat a diet based on starches. Now it eats the American diet. And if you look at countries, you look at well, Japan and China and Thailand, and, you know, there's certain, certain parts of Africa, you see as they switch to the Western diet, you see an increase in risk of colon cancer and heart disease and breast cancer and prostate cancer and diabetes, all, all going along in parallel with the switch from a starch-based diet to the diet that I call the diet of kings and queens, of aristocrats. Yeah. So do you have to get it done? Absolutely not. You don't have to get it done. Are you unwise to not get it done? Yeah, I, I think it's a reasonable decision to not get it done. Uh, is it what I recommend? No, what I recommend is you have one test. I told you what I recommend. Why do I recommend that? Well. Okay, we're going to help a few people by preventing them from dying of colon cancer, which would be good. Those are the people who have one sigmoid exam. Dr. McDougall, people are asking how the stool tests, how accurate are they? And do they always signify colon cancer if you show blood? No, they don't always. Act, uh, they don't always. I'd have to look up the sensitivity and specificity of each of these tests. I don't I can't keep those data at hand. But they're good enough so that the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force tells you that you can do any of these tests and have reasonable outcomes. Uh, there are lots of reasons the stool can be positive for blood. One is you can eat blood. So a standard recommendation when you get a stool test for blood is to not eat meat for like three or four days, maybe longer, before the test. Or if you flunk the test, you need to go on a meat-free diet. That's the standard recommendation because you test, this test is so sensitive that it picks up the blood from the muscle of the cow or the pig, et cetera. So there are other reasons that, you know, there are other sources of bleeding. You could, you know, you could bite the inside of your mouth. I imagine that under certain circumstances would cause enough blood in your stool to be positive. And there are ulcers and, you know, diverticuli bleed. So there, there are many reasons that you could have blood in your stool. 
But the first step is to stop eating the animal foods, get it retested. Then might, you might go through a third stool for blood test, but then you might go on to a sigmoidoscopy or, or well, sigmoid for screening, not a very good diagnostic test. You'd probably go on to a colonoscopy after a positive test. That, that's what I think would be most people's decision. And again, it hasn't been tested whether or not a sigmoid exam would be a reasonable diagnostic approach compared to colonoscopy. It's never tested. But we have tested whether or not a sigmoidoscopy is a good screening test for healthy people. We've tested, I've showed you the results. Colonoscopy is not, not, not a good screening test. Canada says, don't do it for its Canadian citizens. As from 2016, why do you think they've come to this conclusion? Why do you think European countries don't recommend it, most of them, for their, their citizens? Doesn't work. Causes more harm than good. Not, not just the individual, but to our healthcare system, and et cetera. The only people that benefit are those that perform the tests. And the ancillary people, the hospitals, the surgical units, the, you know, they're the ones that make the money off this. Well, Dr. McDougall, you're never boring. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I, I think when the day comes that I have nothing further to say to you or your audience, then I probably will stop doing it. But I still have a few more things I'd like to share with you. And I, I do appreciate very much having so many people interested in the presentations that you and I put together on Mondays. I, I wish you the best of luck with your more stable audience of, of uh, experts. Yeah, it, it, I, I feel like we have a great lineup. And, you know, not everybody's going to like everyone. That's why there's chocolate and vanilla. And well, you know, but Chef AJ, I expect that anybody who has any expertise who's on your show, that you ask them about the research and see what they have to say. People don't like the research if it disagrees with what they believe. I suppose that's na that's that's uh, natural behavior. People love to hear good news about their bad habits, don't they? Yeah, I, I remember somebody saying that. Yeah, you have a lot of. It should be a calendar. One quote a month: "The fat you eat is the fat you wear." I actually, I actually have. I made a list of things that I'd like to see on uh, on my epitaph. A list of, of statements. He was known as the one who said, the fat you eat, the fat you wear. The one that was known as uh, people love to hear good news about their bad habits. There are about, about 20 things I'd like you to write on my gravestone. That would be fantastic. But I, I don't plan on dying. I'm going to live no. to be 500. I can't. Then, you'll, then you'll believe me. Then Once I get to be 470, you'll believe me, won't you? I can't wait. We'll have you on. Like we're having our hundred-year-old friend on often now. Dr. John Sharfenberg is. Oh, you know, I've, often. since I've learned about John Sharfenberg, I, I've tried to emulate his recommendations. He wrote a uh, an endorsement for the McDougal Plan book back in the late seventies, early eighties. He wrote the. I, he was a friend of mine at uh, the Adventist Healthcare System. He, sure. As I mentioned to you before we logged on, I met him in person, and he's just yeah. remarkable. Okay, well, I, I'm going to have to take off. Mary says that it's been yep. a great time. It she was great. And hi, Mary. Hope to see you on a future show as well. She she says she appreciates you not making her go on. Uh, no, the, and well, I, I, it's only up to her comfort level. But when she does come on, oh, she loves she loves being with you. Hey, we'll see you folks at five o'clock Pacific time every Sunday evening. After that, and the links in the show notes. Thanks, Dr. McDougall, so much. And thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back in about 30 minutes for Mrs. Slimon, Ms. Slimon Plans. Maybe it's Mrs., sorry. But anyway, Slimon Plans. She's going to be doing a recipe demo of lentil zucchini boats.